And good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today with Full Compass. My name is Jim Ripp. I'm the manager of technical training and sales development here at Full Compass. And that's I'm the gentleman on the right. Gentleman on the left there is Gino Sijis Mondi joining us from Sure today. Uh, we have a really in-depth uh, subject today. Lots of questions have come through Full Compass regarding this whole whole thing. So we we listened to you, and we're gonna we brought Gino on today to. Uh, to answer a lot of those questions and kind of clear up some of the things there. So let's move forward here with uh, Gino Sigismondi. Um, he's a Chicago, coming to us from live from Chicago today. Uh, this guy has a lot of background. He's a he's an author. He's he's a, a expert in the wireless spectrum update. He's he's also a musician. Plays in a band. He's a guitar player. Um, Gino, uh, if you're there, why don't you? Uh, Give us a little bit more on your background. Uh, tell us about yourself. Oh, talk about myself. I don't. Ugh, okay, yeah. here we go. Um, we'll ten seconds. No. <laughs> yeah, ten seconds. Go. No, I. You know. Okay. So relative to the topic today, uh, it's something that I've been dealing with uh, my entire tenure at Sure, actually, because that's when the FCC first started reallocating television UHF spectrum for other purposes. So I feel like my career is is at sure is inextricably linked to dealing with spectrum issues. So it's something that uh, is ever evolving and ever changing and and a lot of fun uh, because it's uh, it's 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 always good to be able to, to and I love educating people on this stuff on audio on microphones on wireless on all of that stuff, you know, to me getting to uh, you know, besides being involved in the technical support, as I've been doing here for a long time with Sure, um, the actual getting out and doing the training and talking to people about this stuff is is uh, is a lot of fun. All right. So anyway, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, I was talking about myself. I don't think we need to talk about me anymore. We need to talk about why we're here today. Uh, and what we want to talk about here is the current state of the UHF television spectrum as it relates to the latest part of it to be affected, which is the uh, the 600 megahertz band. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, we've been dealing with lots of spectrum changes over the years here that affect wireless microphone users. This just happens to be the latest round. And right now we're kind of in the middle of the uh, well, we're in the thick of it, I guess, as a bunch of things are moving around again. So um, what we'll do here uh, in the next 45 minutes or so is I'll give you sort of the uh, the background on how we got to where we are, um, what the current state of the situation is, and ultimately what you need to do to be prepared for it. So let's let's get right into it. Um, First thing we want to talk about here is is why is why does this even happen, right? Like why why are we dealing with this? Well. If you think about it, the demand for wireless devices of all kinds is just gone through the roof in recent years, right? Everything is wireless from your from your phone to your earphones to your whatever, right? Your iPad. I mean, everything, you know, your home Wi-Fi network, everything wants to be wireless, or I should say everybody wants everything to be wireless these days. And the more stuff that you want to be wireless, the more spectrum that you need in order for that stuff to operate effectively, right? And, you know, what we're what we're seeing here is the fact that, you know, the, the numbers on this slide are actually need to be updated. They're actually old now, but I mean, even going back to 2013, Global mobile data was growing at a rate of 81% that year. That's insane, right? The amount of mobile data in 2013 was 18 times what the total internet was doing into the year 2000. So, I mean, you know, if you like me, I take public transportation to work. I ride the, the L here in Chicago every morning and I see everybody staring at their phone stream and stuff, right? So, you know, you need Spectrum to do that in. So the regulatory bodies in various countries, in the US, it's the FCC, have to look at what's out there in the radio spectrum and find ways to optimize it to accommodate all of these devices. The radio spectrum is a is a, a it's a fixed resource, right? The, you know, if you look at the kind of usable radio spectrum here, right on this chart, this is how the FCC has sliced and diced the radio bands for various different applications. And really the point of showing you this is so that you can see that it's all occupied for something, right? There is no you know, part of the spectrum except the very, very low end of the band around 300 kilohertz or so that's not allocated for something. 
And that spectrum is really not usable down there. You know, as you go lower in frequency, um, you end up with larger antennas that become impractical. Impractical. I mean, we're talking about antennas that would be, you know, miles long potentially at that low of the band. Uh, and as you go higher in frequency, um, antennas get smaller and you have more issues with like body absorption and just path loss, propagation loss, that sort of thing. So you can't really transmit very effectively at too high of a frequency. So all that means that even though there's all this spectrum out there, uh, really the UHF band, which is um, 300 megahertz to actually three gigahertz, uh, is is really what's usable for kind of the sort of personal portable devices that that humans are going to want to interact with. And um, the band that's circled here uh, is the UHF television band, which is actually uh, 470 to previously 698 megahertz. Again, that's what we're going to talk about is how that shrunk, right? Um, but that spectrum is used by television broadcasters in the UHF band and wireless microphone users as well. Now, if you think about it for a second, how many how many of you, and this is a rhetorical question, you don't have to answer, but how many of you watch antenna over the air? I mean, sorry, TV over the air. You put an antenna on your roof and you uh, point it at the local television transmitters and get free, because you can still get free TV over the air. Probably not too many of you, right? In fact, it's 15% of the US population actually watches TV over the air. Um, that's actually it's 17 percent now that's another this is some more information that actually we need to get updated um this was a couple of years ago it was 15 percent. so actually due to well really it's probably due more to people canceling cable and streaming but you know the nab counts national association of broadcasters counts that as you know hey people watching tv with an antenna anyway as a as a as a percentage of the total u.s population that's not a lot of people actually utilizing that spectrum for its intended application which is broadcast tv right however and again this is an old number i believe it's actually 83 82 83 percent of americans own a smartphone now so if you're the fcc looking at spectrum necessary for all of these smartphones out there to operate and you're looking at how many people are actually watching that old free over the air tv you go hmm maybe there's something we can do about that Maybe there's ways we can reallocate some of that television spectrum for mobile data purposes. And that's really what the 600 megahertz auction is all about. But as I mentioned this earlier, you know, I've been dealing with this as long as I've been at Sure. It's really nothing, nothing new. You know, for over 20 years now, the FCC has been kind of hacking away at the UHF band to make it uh, usable for other kinds of services. And that began with the pre uh, transition in the US to digital television in 1997. And that transition allowed um, the FCC to pack all of the broadcast TV channels in a smaller amount of spectrum because digital television is more efficient in terms of its transmission. So that was the 700 megahertz auction, which if you've been in this business for a while, you might remember living through that. Um, the whole process took a long time. It was January of 2008 by the time that whole process finally ended. And uh, as you can see here, the uh, auction brought in $19.6 billion. Wireless microphone users and broadcasters had to get out of there. That was the end of it. Uh, in the midst of all that, uh, the FCC also decided to um, adopt what were called the white space rules. And the idea there was opening up the rest of the UHF spectrum, that is the TV channels, or say the, the frequencies that aren't being used by TV channels to any unlicensed device in the world. This caused a lot of panic in the mic industry, wireless mic industry, because that would make the spectrum completely unpredictable and not really a place where you could reliably operate wireless microphones. Luckily, that business model turned out to be not such a great one, and there really aren't any white space devices out there. So on the one hand, we mention it because technically it's a legal thing, and manufacturers could actually make these devices that you know could would randomly be running around the UHF spectrum uh, on an unlicensed basis. But it turns out, you know, almost uh, over ten years later now that it. It's not really an issue, um, so we don't really need to spend a, too much time talking about it. But we spent a lot of time talking about it ten years ago. Um, in uh, in June of 2010, the DTV transition was finally complete. That was the 700 megahertz transition. But then in May of 2014, the FCC adopts another uh, report and order for what we call the incentive auction. 
So what is an incentive auction? Well, when the FCC decided that they wanted to go down and start auctioning off some of the 600 megahertz band, um, it hadn't really been long enough since the previous auction where they felt comfortable taking more spectrum away from the broadcasters. Um, politically, uh, probably wouldn't have been such a good move. So instead, they came up with this idea of what's called an incentive auction, where now the FCC was going to ask broadcasters to auction off their current UHF television channel and either move down to VHF or get out of the spectrum altogether, or get out of, actually get out of the business altogether and just stop broadcasting or share channels with other broadcasters, but somehow relinquish your UHF channel so that they could auction 600 megahertz spectrum and get into a uh, into a, a, a you know a, another auction without having to just kick the broadcasters out like they like they did in 700 megahertz. But of course, the implication for wireless microphones is if they sell that spectrum to somebody else, the wireless microphones are not going to be allowed to operate in that spectrum either. So again, the auction came to be with the passing of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012. That was uh, within that, um, well, you know, Congress will pass anything that says tax relief and job creation in it, right? Buried within that was a bunch of things. But one of them was the idea that we could auction off some more spectrum and get um, not only more spectrum for mobile broadband, but actually use that money to fund the nationwide public safety network and have hopefully have a little bit left over to put into the treasury. And again, how are they going to do that uh, with this voluntary incentive auction to encourage broadcasters to participate in the auction? And then, of course, some of that, again, the proceeds from the auction this time would be shared with the broadcasters. So they stood to make some money off of that. Just to give you a quick timeline of what happened here, because, um, again, like these things always do, they take a little while. The report and order was approved in May of 2014. It took until March of 2016 to actually start the auction. And there were several phases that went through the auction as the FCC, um, I'm sorry, as the broadcasters and the uh, mobile broadband providers that were bidding on the spectrum kind of had to, you know, go through a number of rounds to get to uh, an actual number that everybody agreed on. Um, and then about six months after that, the new, the new channel reassignment public notice came out that's basically like, okay, here's what the new channel map is going to look like. And right where we're at now is at point number four, we are in this in the middle, uh, actually probably a little past the middle of this 39 month uh, repack of transition. Possible auction outcomes. Um, again, you know, there was many different ways that this auction could have went. The FCC didn't really know at the start of it how much spectrum they were um, going to be able to actually reclaim because it depends depended on how many broadcasters uh, chose to participate in the auction. So what we're looking at here, the numbers in the boxes here in white represent actual TV channels. So TV channel 21, 22, 23, et cetera, right? And how they're, how they're allocated out. And then on the, the letters in the blue boxes are the paired bands that were being auctioned off. So if you're T-Mobile and you're bidding on Spectrum, you're actually bidding on both A bands or both B bands or A, B, and C, depending on how much Spectrum you want, but they're paired bands, one's uplink, one's downlink, right? And the number on the left-hand side over here, uh, the big numbers uh, are how much um, spectrum would be lost or reallocated if that ended up being the winning scenario. So you can see in a in a what what for us would have been a worst case scenario, they were they there was a a potential scenario that could have resulted in 144 megahertz of spectrum being auctioned. When the auctions actually started, they were at 126 megahertz. That didn't go because uh, the FC because uh, the broadcasters and the and the mobile carriers couldn't agree on a price, so it dropped to 114. 108, eventually down to 84 megahertz, and that's where we landed with the spectrum auction. So again, to the tune of about $19 billion, uh, a number of broadcasters agreed to, again, either go off the air, switch channels, or somehow move out of that spectrum so that now, basically, everything above TV channel 37, actually, that's not really a TV channel, that's actually allocated for radio astronomy and um, medical telemetry, that's why it's orange. Uh, but anyway, everything above that um, was now going to be auctioned off for other purposes. Who won the auction? You can see uh, the, the big pink color there. T-Mobile was the big winner. They got the biggest uh, amount of spectrum out of this, along with some other smaller carriers and Dish Network and some other things like that. So where did that money go? Again, uh, uh, there was 175 stations that participated in the auction. So those are the ones that got the, that part of the portion of the payout. 
again, some of it needs to be allocated for uh, moving expenses and the rest, of course, goes into the uh, into the treasury. So that's about it. Now, for just an, as an interesting side note, uh, the original 700 megahertz auction that happened in the in the early 2000s brought in 19.6 billion dollars. So all the 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 PR that said Spectrum was worth so much and was going to bring in all these, you know, so much more money, it ended up being uh, about the same. But at any rate, it did happen. It's over with. And now we are in the middle of the this transition here. So um, the transition is being rolled out in multiple phases. And phases are uh, referred to a grouping of cities or television markets and when they actually have to complete their transition by. And this um, is done this way because there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of uh, physically changing out transmitters and antennas for these broadcasters to change channels. So you couldn't do it all at once. There's not enough um, TV uh, antenna crews in the country to be able to handle that. So instead, we're in this little bit of a phased timetable here. So again, depending on where you're at, you may have already been through the transition and 600 megahertz is more or less off limits to you or it's still to come. Uh, Chicago, for example, is in phase six. So right now we're kind of in this testing period, getting ready to uh, uh, actually complete the transition in a couple of weeks. So uh, I will show you um, in a little bit uh, when we talk about some online resources where you can actually find out uh, more complete information on where your city is at in the transition and what channels are going to be moving around. Uh, again, just to recap, these, this is the spectrum that is available in the U.S. for wireless microphones. And the blue ones are the, are the ranges that are shared with broadcasters, so VHF television and UHF television. The gold bars are the consumer bands. And we point this out so that you can see that there are other spectrum options available besides UHF, right? So if you're just sick of dealing with all this auction stuff, uh, there are other places to go, 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, the decked band. But there's compromises whenever you move to a different band. And the thing about UHF is that despite all of the issues we've had with spectrum reallocation, it is still the largest block and the most predictable block in which to operate. That's one of the major trade-offs was going to 2.4 gigahertz. You know, if you're just using a couple of channels, more of an entry-level type application, it's fine. But the interference potential there and, and the amount of open spectrum, I and mean, you can imagine how crowded 2.4 gigahertz. So it becomes harder to find reliable channels in that spectrum. So for most multi-channel pro wireless applications, UHF with VHF being a close second, still the best places to be. So uh, as we've said, again, before the auction, um, the, the television band extended up to 698 megahertz. The current landscape now um, actually has it ending at 614 megahertz with the rest part of the what was auctioned off. But here we can take a bit more granular look at it. And I think this is kind of uh, somewhat illustrative because as I mentioned earlier, there's there's actually the, the paired blocks of spectrum that were auctioned off, the uplink and the downlink band with what's called a du duplex gap in between and a guard band just above TV channel 37. So the guard band is there to actually protect that medical telemetry stuff from interference from mobile broadband devices. So there's that two megahertz chunk there between 614 and 616 megahertz that is actually usable by wireless microphones. Whether you're licensed or unlicensed, doesn't matter. You actually uh, have access to that spectrum if you would like to use it. Uh, and there's really nothing else. It's actually the only part of spectrum uh, that nationwide is available only to wireless microphones. That's really kind of a nice thing. Uh, again, it's not a lot of spectrum. You can't use more than a couple channels there, but if you want to know what is the one part of the spectrum that you have exclusive access to as a wireless microphone, that's it, those two megahertz right there. Um, we also have access to what's called the duplex gap, which is a gap that is intentionally between the uplink and downlink bands, uh, again, to prevent those from interfering with each other. Uh, wireless microphones also have access to, uh, to that spectrum. The lower four megahertz is for licensed users only. Uh, the upper six megahertz is for licensed or unlicensed wireless microphone users. Notice that in both the case of the duplex gap and the guard band, 
the power limitation is 20 milliwatts, which is lower than in the rest of the UHF spectrum, where actually technically you can operate up to 250 milliwatts, although uh, if you're licensed or 50 milliwatts if you're unlicensed. Um, but at any rate, if you choose to operate in these other um, parts of the 600 megahertz spectrum that are still available to you, it's just at a lower power level. And, uh, you know, again, is, is this the best spectrum to be? No, again, you do have that power limitation to deal with. It may be a little bit just noisier, especially in that duplex gap. But uh, again, just so you're aware, 600 megahertz is not um, as it, it, the, the prohibition on operating there is not monolithic. Um, a lot of people think you can't use anything above 600, and four, 600 megahertz because that's what they hear the auction is. But technically, you can use up to 616 megahertz as well as the duplex gap if your equipment is capable of tuning there. To give you an idea of how the repack is affecting us, though, and this is this is something that is often missed, right? Is is uh, for a while now we've been telling people you need to get out of 600 megahertz, right? That's kind of obvious uh, because that's being um, being auctioned. However, uh, that means that you know some of the TV channels went off the air, but some of them didn't, which means they needed to move to a lower channel. The ones that participated in the auction probably moved to a VHF channel or went off the air. If you chose not to participate, the FCC still needed to move you out of 600 megahertz, so they put you on a lower UHF channel. So right now, this is this is pre-transition. This is what it looks like today in Chicago in terms of the black boxes there representing TV channels that are on the air. Post-transition, we faced with that. So. Um, the unfortunate side effect of the of the auction is that the existing UHF television band not only is getting smaller, but it's getting more crowded. And again, what this is going to look like is going to vary per city. But what this means is that to go back a slide, like look at okay, channels 22 through 26 currently are open in Chicago. After the transition, they're all gone. So how this can impact existing users is that frequencies that previously you had been using, you can't anymore. If you have a system that is wideband tuning enough to get you to one of the where one of the clear channels are, that's great, right? You just retune or rescan your system to find a clear frequency. And that's always the first thing I tell people when they want to know, like, why is my wireless mic dropping out? Well, you probably need to scan for a new frequency. In this case, you know, you might have been sitting on a frequency for, you know, 10 years and it's always been fine. But now everything's moving around, everything's up for grabs, and you might have to retune to a new frequency. In the unfortunate case that the system you currently have won't get to where one of those clear channels are, at that point, you probably will, will need to switch that out for a different wireless system that can get to where those clear channels are. Um, and that's why when people had been seeking our advice previous to the auction about what, the, what they should buy to be future-proof, we would always say you want to buy the system that has the widest possible tuning range so that you can get to where those clear frequencies are and the best spectral efficiency, which really means how many wireless mics can I cram into one TV channel if that was all that was open to me. If I had, let's say, TV channel 16 was the only spectrum available in Chicago, how many wireless mics is this system capable of running in that small amount of spectrum? Just to give you some numbers behind that to think about, an inefficient system, an entry-level wireless could maybe do four or five per TV channel. Uh, a really high-end system like our uh, Axion Digital or ULXD, even QLXD, you can do like 17 wireless mics in one TV channel. Plus, that system has a 64 megahertz tuning range, which is going to give you a much better shot at getting to where those clear channels are. So um, it's going to take a little more homework to, to make this work, but um, the good news is there's lots of wireless mic systems out there that that can kind of handle this. And again, that's the best way to future proof yourself. Ultimately, it comes down to two questions. Uh, do I need to move at frequencies or systems? And when does this need to happen? As far as if you need to move, if your wireless microphone system can tune into the auction spectrum, if it can tune into anywhere between 616 to 653, or if it can tune into the ranges of 663 to 698, you will need to stop using it at some point, right? Um, also, again, as I just mentioned, if your wireless mic system operates on a TV channel that is below 616, that used to be open, but isn't any longer because the TV channel got reallocated down there, 
you're going to have to move to a different frequency. And how are you going to know? Because your wireless mic is going to stop working, basically. <laughs> you're going to be getting so many dropouts that it's unusable. That's what happens when interference, uh, when a TV channel drops down on your frequency. So you'll need to either move to a new frequency if you can. And if you can't find one, you might need to upgrade your system. When do you need to move? Two numbers here. One, I'll start with the lower one, July 3rd, 2020. That is when the final phase of the transition ends. By that date, all wireless microphone operation in above 616 megahertz needs to stop. However, if you're in one of those cities where the transition has already occurred and T-Mobile has got their system, I'm using T-Mobile as an example because they have the most spectrum there. If T-Mobile has fired up and is going to town, you have to stop. And again, that's gonna be kind of obvious because if T-Mobile is operating on your frequencies, uh, that's going to cause issues for you, right? And you're probably going to wonder why your system isn't working anymore. So again, July 3rd, 2020, the ultimate drop dead date, or if T-Mobile is already up and running or whoever is already up and running with their new service, then you should no longer be using those frequencies. Okay, um, a little bit of a sidebar here, but it's worth talking about here, and that is licensing. Um, and it's not directly related to the 600 megahertz repack, but it's important to at least discuss it because you might be hear about it and there is some confusion about what it means. Prior to, to 2009, officially, according to FCC regulations, you actually did need to have a license to operate a wireless microphone system in the television band. Not only that, you had to be a broadcaster in order to get a license, which of course, think about how many wireless mic users there are out there that aren't broadcasters. After the DTV transition ended, uh, the FCC created a new category of unlicensed wireless mic users. Basically what they did is they gave a uh, blanket amnesty to all wireless mics out there that didn't have a license and said, that's okay, you can keep operating on an unlicensed basis. However, the category of being a licensed wireless mic user still exists. Uh, why would you care about that? Why would you even want to get a license? Well, first of all, uh, before we talk about that, it's important to note that the eligibility for who can get a license has been expanded beyond just broadcasters, right? However, broadcasters have the ability to get a license no matter how many wireless mics they're using. doesn't matter. They can always get a license. If you use 50 or more channels of wireless on a regular basis, you can also get a license. That list of entities shown on the column on the right there isn't the, isn't an exhaustive list. That's just an example of some of the entities who use a lot of wireless and may want to get a license and previously couldn't, but now you can. But really, ultimately, anybody that uses 50 or more channels of wireless audio, and that includes in-ear monitors and wireless comms in addition to wireless mics, um, you can, if you can do that, uh, demonstrate that you do that on a, on a regular basis, you can go ahead and get a license. I realize there sounds like there's some gray area there, and there is, and that's why if you decide that you do like do want to get a license, we suggest um, going with an entity that can assist you with that. There are several companies, um, some uh, wireless mic providers, um, by providers I mean like production companies, as well as uh, law firms that specialize in communications law that could help you with this process. Why do you care about getting a license? A couple of things. Um, one, number one is uh, you can register to get protected TV channels for you, for you in the television band to prevent interference from, interference from white space devices. Uh, have, I mentioned earlier, those don't really exist, but should they ever become a thing that you have to be concerned about, this is, that's a nice advantage. You can transmit at higher power levels up to 250 milliwatts or at least you legally can do that. Um, in addition to more uh, access to additional spectrum opportunities, outside of the television bands, which is uh, which is kind of a good thing. So, um, you know, we're always looking at new spectrum to produce wireless microphones in. Again, as we mentioned earlier, it's all allocated for something. So anything we go to is going to have to be shared. And depending on what it's being shared with, that access might only be granted to actual licensed wireless, uh, wireless microphones. Uh, you also are granted the Again, the legal authorization to operate on the same frequencies as a broadcast television channel, provided 
the signal strength indoors is below minus 84 dBm. I realize that's a number that's not going to mean a lot to people, but basically um, if you are able to do a scan and see that that TV channel is not actually getting into your facility, which if the building provides enough shielding or you're far enough away happens a lot, legally the FCC says it's okay for you to then operate wireless mics on those channels. Again, how do you get a license? Uh, we recommend going with a specialist that can assist you with it, um, but it's FCC Form 601 and it's $165. So there you go. Um, again, that's not necessarily uh, an overwhelming, convincing, overwhelmingly convincing argument to go get a license, but if you want to understand what the advantages are, that is what they are. So where are we at today? Again, where we're at right now is the middle of the repack. So in certain cities that have already been through it, Houston is an example of one, Miami's example of another one, where all of the DV channels that we're going to move have moved, and the situation is, is what it is, and now you can plan accordingly. Um, if you are in one of the cities that hasn't transitioned yet, uh, and you're worried about how it might affect you, um, you can find several places online to check into what the current TV channel situation is, what it's going to be later on, where the channels are going to move around and what the timetable is. So saying that, I'll move on to the resources slide. Um, there's a bunch of long links here, but most of them can easily be found through a Google search or a search on the SURE website. So number one is the SURE Incentive Auction resource page. Um, I'll actually show you that in a minute. Uh, SURE Wireless Workbench software. I'm going to get to a demonstration of that before we're done here. The SURE Wireless Frequency Finder, another tool on our website that I'll show you a place where you can find user uploaded scans of different cities and uh, more information about the transition from the official FCC website. Um, to give you the, 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 the short version or kind of maybe even reiterate something I already said, which is scanning for clear frequencies is really the critical element here, right? There are a number of tools, which again, I'll show you where you, that you can go online and try and research what channels are broadcasting and which ones are open and which ones aren't. But ultimately, the wireless mic that's in the room where you're going to be using it, the receiver, knows best which frequencies are the ones that you want to use. And being able to either scan with the receiver itself or go online and find some scan files that other users have updated um, or use our wireless workbench software to capture a scan, that's really where you want to be. But let, let's take a look here at some of these, some of these tools. Um, so first up is is uh, in the FAQ on our website. Actually, if you just search incentive auction, it'll pull right up this FAQ, which gives you everything you need to know, more detail than I've even gone into today about the auction. And there's also some videos here. Um, so this is kind of the first thing to look at, right? Now, um, a question that often comes up is, well, all right, what if I have a Sure Wireless mic system that operates in 600 megahertz? But also, I can tune it below 616, so I can get to frequencies that are still legal, or I can get to frequencies that are in that du duplex gap. Is it okay to still keep using that system? The short answer is no, you can't. According to the FCC regulations, if the system you have can tune into the auction spectrum, you have to stop using it by next July. Um, they don't trust, I guess, that our users are going to be honest enough to just promise to stay out of the auction spectrum, right? So to, the, to help support users of products that have this, we ha you actually have the ability to band limit through this conversion tool uh, that system so that you are actually can only tune it into the legal frequencies, right? So it'll essentially create a, a blackout zone or it'll actually modify the equipment so that you can't transmit it on the auction spectrum, only this part that's left over that's legal to you. This is a permanent change to the product that can't be undone, but again, for any of our firmware updatable networkable wireless systems, so that's QLXD, ULXD, Axiant Digital, PSM1000, all of those can be updated and converted to stay legal. Now, again, you're, you're reducing the amount of spectrum that the system can tune to, right? So there is a little bit of a, I guess, uh, uh, of, a, of a, a permanent hampering of the device's capabilities that you're doing. But um, if there's enough spectrum left over in your area to operate in, it allows you to keep using it without having to buy anything new. So it's a free conversion that is possible. And this video explains more about this. 
But at the bottom of the page here um, is uh, the phase transition timelines, right? So it kind of tells you which each when each phase is supposed to end and which cities are affected. Um, it's not all of them. Uh, the list is pretty exhaustive. We didn't couldn't include every every market in the U.S. just for readability purposes here. But you can kind of get an example in the major markets at least when the transitions are happening. Again, next up is Chicago, Indianapolis, Nashville, Milwaukee, Cincinnati, Grand Rapids, Louisville, Lexington, Dayton, Charleston, and a few more. So if you're in one of those cities, um, be prepared on October 18th, uh, or maybe even ahead of time if they're already testing. You might need to start changing some frequencies on your wireless systems. So again, that's that's a useful tool. The frequency finder on the SURE website, which is under support, uh, tools, and then SURE wireless frequency finder, this is where you can go in and put in your address or your, your zip code and choose a system. And it'll tell you what TV channels are on the air and um, how many frequencies you can use. But the limitation of this system is it's all pre-transition, pre-auction. So this only gives you the today state or the yesterday state for, for cities that have already been through the auction. And we're working with our database provider, Keybridge, to get that updated and stay more current. In fact, we should be within days of rolling that out. But it is important for you to know that, uh, again, what, what you're looking at here is not the future state. So if you want to see what the future state is, one way to do it requires a little bit of research, but that link I showed you for the FCC on the FCC website about incentive auctions shows you again the transition schedule. I showed you this slide earlier with the dates. But if you click on regions here, this shows you which regions uh, are include which television markets. So each one of these dots, colored dots represents a television market. So you can find the dot that's closest to you. That's your TV market. That'll tell you which region you're in. And then once you know that, you can actually go um, download a spreadsheet that will give you um, the transition schedule uh, as far as, and the actual channel numbers. I think I downloaded this thing. Let me see if I can actually pull that spreadsheet up here. Give me a second. Downloads. So for the central plane states, for example, this Excel spreadsheet open up, pull it here where you can see it, right? Okay, so here we can see for the central plains region, uh, you can sort by any one of these columns, but for like, you know, the Springfield, Missouri, right? They're in phase one, that means it already happened. Pre-auction, they were channel 49. Now they're going down to channel 22. And this is something that, um, that, that Sure can help you with as well. Um, you can always call or, or send an email to Sure Applications Engineering, uh, and we can actually give you an idea of what the spectrum is going to look like afterwards as well. But again, all the resources are available online should you want to research them a little bit more. But again, as I keep saying, the best thing to do is to do a scan on site, right? All of the Sure wireless systems are capable of doing some sort of scan. However, the network Sure devices, the ones that have an Ethernet port on them, like QLXD, UXD, Axiom Digital, you can actually use it in conjunction with our wireless workbench software to go online and do a scan, right? And you do that in the frequency coordination tab. And again, if you're not used to wireless workbench, I apologize for kind of jumping right into it, but we're getting short on time here and I wanna make sure I leave some time for Q&A, right? But uh, if it's a free download from the Sure website under software. Um, and again, it installs a PC or Mac. And if you connect your computer to the wireless receivers that you have, uh, you can use that receiver to do a scan. So in frequency coordination, in the spectrum tab, you go scan data, right? And you can then choose a network receiver and hit start and you'll see the receivers start to build a scan here. Now we're not seeing much because uh, the receiver I'm actually connected to doesn't have antennas hooked up to it so we're not going to see anything very interesting so I'm going to go ahead and stop that scan but I can also you can save scan files and store them on your computer. So here's a scan for example that I did in Melbourne Australia last month and now you can see a little bit more of kind of what's going on here. In fact, that's not useful because we're not in Australia and they don't have as many TV channels as we do. Let's try a different one here. That was just a recent one. 
Let's look at this one. Ah, it's much more interesting. So now the numbers along the bottom here represent a television channel. And uh, those television channels, again, are, you know, just the UHF channels. And you can see the actual frequencies. And these six megahertz blocks, you can easily see are a TV channel. There's TV channel 29. Here's TV channel 31. Here's TV channel 32, right? Um, TV channel 36, et cetera, right? Now, if we want to be extra careful, again, this is the scan data. We can also click on the TV channels gear down here and do a zip code search just like we do online. So I'm putting in my zip code, hit search for TV channels, and now I get a list of all of the TV channels and some information about them that are in the database. But again, this database is pre-auction, pre-transition. At some point in the next, well, hopefully in less than a year, it'll be updated to include all the post-transition stuff. But again, that's why I say it's so important to do a scan because if you look at the red bars that are in here now, these red bars are what the database thinks are TV channels that are on the air. And you can see some of them line up, some of them don't. This database thinks TV channel 17 is on the air and it's blocked it out, right? Well, that's not you know good information, right? The scan is telling us what's really going on because you can see that there's nothing there. So I can actually go through and right click on this and remove that red bar. And I can do it here on TV channel 21 because I can see that that's good spectrum, right? So we could tweak the data however we want. But the point is now that we have real good live data on what's going on in the room, I can quickly bring the frequencies from my inventory over, which in this case is just one Axiom digital receiver. Not, and the yellow frequencies mean they haven't been allocated a new one yet. I can hit calculate and it found frequencies and now I have that easily, I have four frequencies that are no are good ones. So really this is gonna become a practice that especially for large multi-channel installs where there's a lot of wireless, this, this is the most powerful and accurate way that you can make sure that after the repack happens, you've got frequencies that you know are good for your area. And again, it's a free tool, no, no cost to download it, install it and play around with it and see if you can get it to work. On our YouTube channel, we've got dozens of videos on how to use wireless workbench. Um, as you can see, it's pretty straightforward for a small number of systems to do this, um, but definitely uh, something you wanna take a look at. Uh, and oh, by the way, did I mention it's free? Oh, one other thing, sorry, I forgot to show you this too. Um, this website that is scans.sure.com. You can't find a link to this on our website um, because it's still sort of beta, so take it for what it's worth, but um, it does exist. And what you can do here is you can actually go in and search an area for user uploaded scan files. Users that have done scans at venues around the world and uploaded them for others to download. So I could go here and I could say, I could download a scan from the United Center and then within Wireless Workbench, and by the way, this it's worth paying attention to when the scan one does. Some of these are quite old. Here's one, you know, this, the, the uh, United Center one is from 2016. So it's been a little while, but for illustrative purposes, let me go back to uh, to Workbench here. Uh, I can remove this scan file and I can open up the one that I downloaded. Where did I put it? Sorry, downloads. Uh, I can't find that one, but it doesn't matter. We'll just use this Baltimore one as an example, right? So here's scan scan data from Baltimore, right? That another user had uploaded. So again, um, you know, some of those scans are quite old, but feel free to use that website if you can't get there and do a scan yourself. Another tool that's out there. Okay, so that's, uh, I think that's actually about it. Uh, it was a lot of stuff. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Jim and see if there's any questions that I might be able to answer for people. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this this one comes from Thomas. It says currently using SLX system, have looked at the QLX and ULX and saw the mention of AES 256 encryption. Does that do anything to help block? Ah, inter block interference. Um, well, no. What encryption does for you is it buys you secure transmission, right? So that nobody else 
can pick up your wireless microphone and eavesdrop on your conversation and also prevents the receiver from passing audio from any from its from any other transmitter except the one it's encrypted with so that's more of a security thing um doesn't really do anything for you as far as interference mitigation goes though good question so if you could address if, if somebody has a system that operates in both the auctioned and non-auctioned area how should they handle that Ah, okay. Yeah, so I kind of touched on this earlier, right? According to the FCC uh, regulations on this matter, if your system tunes into both the um, the auction and non-auction bands, then um, you're not supposed to use it anymore. However, if it's one of our systems that is networkable and has updatable firmware, we do have that band conversion tool that you can use, which will make it legal because it will then only be able to tune into the spectrum that is still legal. So if you can update it and convert it, great, you can keep using it. If not, then by July of next year, you're going to have to replace it with a system that operates in the legal bands only below 616 megahertz. Uh, I have a, an interesting question here. We have actually a couple people tuned in that are not in the United States. Does that affect them in any way, this auction, this whole repack? Does that affect anybody outside of the United States? Oh, great question. Actually, no, it doesn't. Um, this is purely a, a U.S. matter, at least at this point. That doesn't mean that other countries may not follow suit. Uh, often what happens with a lot of this, the, the spectrum reallocations that we've seen is the U.S. kind of does it first, and then everybody sees what happens, and then they follow some years later. Uh, if, if it's going to affect anybody, it might be Canada, because being the sharing the northern border, just for purposes of synchronicity, in fact, actually, now that I think about it, I'm recalling last time I was in Canada that that is something they are going to do eventually is 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 uh, move their broadcasters out of that spectrum simply because that long shared border we have means they're going to have to. So that that will affect Canada at some point. Um, I'm not sure what that date is. Uh, anywhere else in the world, though, no, it doesn't. This doesn't affect you um, at all. Go ahead. There's a question. If what are the chances that I get caught if I have something that's in that? range the the already auctioned range ah that's a good question that's something we've been hearing through every spectrum transition from customers it's like well am i really going to get caught i mean is the fcc running around you know with black vans uh and scanners looking for illegal wireless microphone users well, the answer to that is no they're not doing that they don't have the resources to be able to just you know go run around the country looking for people that are operating wireless mics on illegal frequencies the FCC enforcement has always been a complaint-driven uh, organization, right? So what that means is that if you keep using your wireless microphone system in the 600 megahertz band and T-Mobile customers start complaining that their data is not working correctly, um, T-Mobile is going to investigate what's going on and they are going to figure out that you're still using wireless microphones and then they're going to send the FCC out to investigate, right? Again, that's what they mean by complaint driven. Um, just so people know, if you do get caught, and I mean, I'll admit in being candid here, the chances maybe are slim, right? But if you get caught, the the fines for operating on an illegal frequency could be as high as $4,000 per microphone or per frequency of violation per day. Now, we don't know of anybody that's actually gotten smacked with that kind of um, you know number. Um, but they could also confiscate your equipment. There could be I guess, some fine. So it's often not worth the risk, not to mention, I mean, it's illegal, right? I mean, you should, you know, be a good citizen, right? Follow the law and, and get out of that spectrum when the day comes that you need to be um, out of that spectrum rather than, than run the risk of it. So thank you so much, Gino. All right. You're welcome. Thanks for having me and uh, have a good day, everybody. Thank you.